Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone, and welcome. Um, my name is Giovanna Villa, and I'm a humanitarian child protection specialist and consultant with UNICEF on children associated with armed forces and armed groups. I also co-lead the CAFAC task force of the Alliance for Child Protection. And I'm very happy to be here today um, to facilitate this session on community level child protection and working across sectors. Thank you very much for joining. So um, we're going to introduce our speakers and the run of the event, but before that, we wanted to give um, some information just very quickly um, about the technology. And um, so, uh, you will have joined already other sessions um, in the last couple of days, but if you need interpretation, please press on the icon at the bottom of your Zoom um, uh, page, uh, the one with the globe, and choose your um, language of choice. And um, we will uh, also um, keep, we will be using breakout rooms later, so we'll give um, some um, further instructions on how to join them. But uh, um, if you have any problems with um, connectivity or audio, please write in the chat and our producers will try their best to help. So um, welcome again. And before we start, I'd like to introduce my co-facilitator for this session, um, Riyad Anajem, um, who is a, um, the executive director of the um, NGO Hura Network. Um, you can say hello, Riyad, if you want. Yeah, thank you so much, Rio. And hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, it's very exciting to be uh, on this session today, uh, helping uh, Rio facilitate this. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so um, we will talk about, um, uh, we will introduce our speakers shortly and uh, just wanted to say a few words to frame the session. So um, in this session, the running theme is um, um, when you really en engage communities in all stages of the program cycle, multi-sector and integrated programming becomes inevitable to provide um, holistic um, family and community support and services, which can ultimately lead to improved child protection outcomes and also can help reducing child protection risks. So the, the speakers today will give us um, different perspectives and will tell us about how they have approached this topic from, their, um, from different angles. And so um, I would like to introduce them to, to you. Uh, we are very lucky to have three um, experienced um, organic organizations and um, they um, they come with seven speakers. So we uh, we have, you know, uh, quite a busy uh, panel and um, let me introduce them in um, in sequence. So we first have uh, our colleagues from PLAN. We have Selena Fortich, Child Protection Manager at PLAN Philippines. Uh, Gertrude Ndlovu, Child Protection Technical Lead at Plan Zimbabwe, and Claire Lofthouse, Child Marriage Technical Advisor at Plan International. And um, our colleagues from Plan will um, talk about what they've learned from girls and, and their communities about child marriage to inform humanitarian programming. The second um, organization we'll be speaking today is Save the, uh, Save the Children International uh, with Roberta Gadler, Child Protection Technical Advisor, and Salek Uda, Advocacy and um, Campaign Advisor. They both work in Mali. And the title of their presentation is Embedding the Centrality of Protection into Humanitarian Work Across Sectors is Crucial to Protect the Most Vulnerable Children from Harm. So looking forward to hearing about that too. And then we have our uh, third and last speaker. So um, our colleagues from World Vision International, Lean Descartes, Child Protection Senior Technical Advi Advisor, and Edouard Ngoy, Operations Director, um, working in Central African Republic, OCAR. And they will present their topic on localization in practice how World Vision in Central African Republic listened to affected populations and gave them a voice to shape the, pro the project design and cross-sector response planning in Bangasu, in the region of Bangasu. So you can see we have some really interesting discussions ahead of us, but before we give the floor to our speakers, I'd like to launch a short poll with Menti and I will let Ria take, um, take over. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Gio. Um, and now it's time like for fun. Let's get a bit interactive here. Um, so we have our first question for the audience. Um, you can go to, to Mentilink, it should be in the chat right now. And we'd like to get a feeling of uh, uh, how much experience do you have working directly in community-based CP? So please do uh, choose uh, um, an option. You have a lot, some, not much, and not at all. So you give it a minute or so. So we start getting some, some answers. So I'm not sure if we're going to see the, the results or yeah, here we go. So we have a bit of a diverse um, audience. Most of you do have uh, a bit or some lot uh, of experience. It would be a great discussion today. And uh, I'm looking forward to share off all of your experiences in the uh, breakout rooms after the presentations. That's great. Um, I think we will go now to the next question. We have two questions to start with. Mm -hmm. And the next question is, based on your experience, how challenging is it to work across sectors? Um, I think you will, you will, uh, yeah, now I'm starting to see the, okay, challenging, it's leading right now. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we do have our answer and I think the Minty will, will be still open. So if anyone did not, uh, get the chance to participate right now, you can always just go to the link and, and submit your answer. And now back to you, Gio. Thank you, Ria. Thanks very much. I find it interesting that um, challenging actually went head to head with not very challenging. So hopefully we're going to be able to unwrap this a little bit later um, in the either in the breakout rooms or um, in the um, through the direct questions to, to the panel. So we'll see. Um, I think they both uh, can have the, 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 the merits and the rights. So yes, so before we listen to start, um, before we, we listen to our speakers, apologies, um, um, I would just uh, like to um, give you like a quick run of the event. So um, the presentations will run for about 30 minutes. So our uh, each organization will speak for about 10 minutes. And after each presentation, we will share many links um, in the chat box where you can share your thoughts on, on the presentation. So anything that comes to mind that you might want to share um, with, the, with the speakers or something that um, you know um, triggers uh, further uh, analysis that you might want to then take into the group work in the breakout rooms. And so, um, but um, just to say that to ensure that we keep to time, we will leave the Menti links open and we will just let the, the presentations uh, proceed. After the um, the thirty minutes, we will take um, a short break, um, four or five minutes, and this will be followed by some group work in um, breakout rooms for about twenty minutes. Um, We'll just leave it open for now and see how um, uh, the the conversation go um, goes, and then uh, we'll decide to keep it maybe to fifteen or twenty minutes to just then have enough time to also address some of your questions um, in in the last part of this session, which is the panel and Q and A. So um, please, uh, if you do have questions as we move through um, through the, the, the session, please do capture them in the chat box and we will do our best to have them answered. Um, so yeah, we're good. Uh, we're perfectly on time. So I would like to start by introducing our first presenters for the day, Selena Fortich and Gertrude Glovu um, from PLAN. And I presented them earlier uh, to you. So um, over to Selena and um, Gertrude. You have 10 minutes for the presentation and I will flag uh, when you have two minutes left with, with a post-it note. Thank you, over to you. Thank you, Giovanna. And um, pleasant morning, day, afternoon to everyone. I'm Selena Fortich, the Child Protection Manager at Plan International Philippines. and. Uh, 
I will be joined by my colleague, Trude, uh, the Child Protection Technical Lead from Plan International Zimbabwe. So together we are going to share with you lessons and recommendations from our community-driven research that we conducted on child marriage in two humanitarian settings. It's called Our Voices, Our Future. Next slide, please. Okay. This research was the cornerstone of Plan International's Child Marriage and Humanitarian Initiative. It is a phased approach uh, to deliver evidence-based and practice-informed programming to prevent and respond to child marriage in humanitarian settings. Partnering with the Women's Refugee Con Commission and national research partners, we conducted a multi-country, girl-centered, community-based research to identify how the drivers of child marriage change as a result of crisis, and also to unpack the system of support required to tackle child marriage in humanitarian settings. So the research took place between 2020 to 2022 among communities affected by conflict and displacement in the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim in Mindanao, that is in the Philippines, and communities experiencing food insecurity and climate-related shocks in Sheredzi District, Zimbabwe. In terms of our methods, we used uh, mixed methods of participatory approach to collect and analyze our data. This included desk reviews, key informant interviews with institutional partners and service providers uh, representing the government and as well as civil society organizations. We also conducted participatory group activities with different community groups and also held co-analysis workshops at the community level among the stakeholders. And also uh, we invited some national experts. We also used a research method called SenseMaker the SenseMaker is a mixed narrative uh, research and analysis tool that enables respondents or storytellers to document short, open-ended questions, stories about their lived experiences. SenseMaker is a participant-led uh, because it invites respondents to give meaning to their own story using a series of visual prompts or story prompts as part of the data collection. It ensured that re respondents' perspectives were central to the research process. The SenseMaker also embodies the sur survivor-centered approach by mitigated force disclosure, by providing a platform where the respondents could share stories, but were not obligated to share their own stories. So as a result uh, of over 3,842 stories, so it's a bit huge, uh, Adolescent stories about child marriage were predominantly narrated in third person. Uh, this is considering the sensitive uh, issue among the communities, spe specifically on child marriage. So even when these adolescents were married themselves, this suggests that SenseMaker provided an opportunity for adolescents' voices to be heard without forcing them to disclose when, before they are ready and also inciting uh, incidental trauma. For our participants, uh, we had 3,893 community members who participated in this, research, in this research process across the two studies. This includes 2,026 adolescents of whom 273 identified as being girls who are or have experienced marriage and 62 married boys. A further 35 adolescents did not disclose their status, uh, largely due to the stigma associated to child marriage in both locations. So um, as you can see, we have, uh, in terms of the age uh, sex desegregation, we have 58% uh, or 2,261 female respondents and 42% or 1,912 were males. And we, all, we also had, in terms of adults, we had 1,844 uh, respondent adults and uh, 2,026 adolescents uh, ages 12 to 19 years old. So uh, we were able to interview 273 married girls, 62 married boys, and uh, 35 undisclosed. So I'd like to turn over you now to Gertrude or Claire. Uh, to share us uh, about the successes of our research. Over to you, Claire or Gertrude. 
Thank you so much, Selena. I just want to check. Um, Gertrude, can you, I think I can hear your audio. Are you able to present? No? Okay. Okay. Um, sorry, we're having some technical challenges. So I just wanted to double check before I just stepped in. So um, thanks so much, Selena, for taking us through um, the, the methodology of this uh, two, two country study. Um, now, we wanted to share with you today some of our successes. Of course, we think that we have uh, um, quite a few, but we just wanted to highlight uh, a couple of those uh, today. Um, oh, perfect. Thank you. There was a bit of background noise. Um, and so one of the things that we, we felt was a really big success with this study was that we really were able to dig into um, the sociocultural norms that drive and perpetuate child marriage. So it went really, really um, deep into that understanding, um, uh, which we think was a really big success. And this was um, also able to provide us to explore how the dimensions of the humanitarian crisis are impacted by those drivers, risks and the support system in each separate location um, because of the methodology that we used, uh, which Selena mentioned before just briefly, which was called, um, we used a few different methodologies, but the main one was SenseMaker, which we will come back to in a bit. Um, we were also able to carry out a large scale research study, despite the hard to reach um, locations um, and also the, uh, the crisis dimensions. Um, and on top of all of that, of course, as many of us know, we had um, the COVID-19 pandemic that really restricted um, movement, travel, access, etc. So as you see, the study was from 2020 to 2022. Um, and so was really um, and this is in no small part due to the flexibility and coordination from our country offices and national research partners who were really well placed to be able to nimbly manage all of those changes last minute adaptations and also within an ethical and timely um, timely manner um, we did revise our methodology and tools so that they were uh, in line with COVID-19 precautions um, and government guidance at the time of the data collection. I can't begin to tell you how many revisions we did based on the changing situation. Um, but yeah, I think this was a real, real success given the time of the study. And then we also used an innovative methodology. So SenseMaker um, audio recorded almost 4,000 stories from community members. Um, and as Selena mentioned, um, over half of them were adolescents. And this was really um, in line with a survivor-centered and participant-led way. Um, and this really meant that the participant chose what information they wanted to share, what was most important for them. So we weren't really, we weren't asking them a list of pre predefined questions. We asked them an open-ended question about what is it like to be married as a young person in this community, for example. And they told us whatever they th felt was most important to share with us. Um, so this really helped to reduce the research bias and ensure that adolescent voices were really being heard um, in the study. Um, and we also involved the community within um, many steps of this study, which includes the tools adaptation, the contextualization, the testing, um, as well as in co-analysis processes, which um, generated their own secondary data, which was then also considered into, um, into our findings. Um, so I think we can uh, go to the next slide, please. And I'm going to hand it back over to Selena to... Uh, to take us through some of our challenges. That does say challenges. <laughs> Sorry, I think their formatting's gone off. Challenges and, and lessons learned. So back to you, Selena. Yeah, thank you, Claire. And uh, apologies, I can't go open my uh, video right now because of bandwidth issues. So I'll just take you uh, walk you through in terms of our uh, mistakes and challenges. We will we, challenges uh, and lessons learned. Um, we have. Uh, so we could have drawn, sorry, okay. So the first one is, um, could we have drawn the same conclusions with less data? The strong involvement of the community meant that processes took longer than anticipated and the layers of community analysis increased the amount of data collected because we, uh, we covered uh, a big, uh, in terms of the provinces uh, of the research. So uh, there was also a challenge in terms of uh, the coordination as well as the uh, uh, involvement of the community in terms of the uh, 
uh, processing of data. Uh, in fact, the data set was huge. We wonder as a team if we would have drawn the same conclusions with less uh, data points. That said, the richness of having so much triangulation cannot be overlooked. However, this rigor of study would not be suitable for all settings and likely not in acute crisis, or at least a scale back version. We have been investigating with our technology partner, what would a study look like with only 150 stories to pull from a targeted group? For example, uh, married girls only. Um, another challenge uh, was uh, in terms of planning, the COVID-19, budgeting, uh, staff time, and ca ca capacity building, and the quality of multi-sectoral analysis uh, takes time. So COVID-19 and the community-driven methodology was, uh, was a bigger lift than anticipated for the project teams, especially at the country level, given completing, competing demands and priorities. Similarly, to ensure that analysis were contextually driven meant we needed more time to engage diverse stakeholders to enrich the analysis and remain grounded in the contextual realities. We should have budgeted for more staff time, more resources for the country office, as well as clearer expectations and roles of all those involved uh, in the research process. We also see how essential it is to critically assess each partner's strengths and constraints to ensure that responsibilities are not overwhelming and be flexible to adjust based on realities. As child marriage in humanitarian settings was still a new topic at that time, uh, financing, there were, uh, new few, there were few donors interested in innovative research studies. So it was also our first time to, uh, to be employing the, the sense maker. So uh, in terms of um, uh, another challenge was uh, not planning for sufficient uh, psychosocial support for our data collectors. Although we had provided training and preparation to enumerators, prior to data collection, as well as ensuring the study coordinators provide the psychosocial support and daily check-ins with the team. In both locations, this was not sufficient, especially in Zimbabwe, given the high volume stories that involve abuse, exploitation, mental health challenges, and the overall high prevalence of forced uh, child marriage. And I'd like to quote one of the data collector's experience on this. Uh, said, uh, to be honest, when we started this exercise during the training phase, I thought the story prompt was going to be difficult because in my opinion, I didn't know that child marriages still exist. But during the exercise, I now have a different view and I felt sorry for children that are still practicing child marriage. A lot needs to be done both in the rural and urban areas. I'm still thinking about these stories uh, a lot. So this uh, shows that um, when we, when we also conduct the research, uh, we need to give uh, um, psychosocial support as well to our data collectors. So uh, I think these are some of the challenges and lessons learned from, uh, from the research. So back to you, uh, Claire, for our top recommendations. Thanks, Selena. Um, and in the interest of time, I will be quite quick. So if we could just go to the, yeah, perfect, the next slide. Um, so just a few top line recommendations, and then we can discuss any of this more in the breakout group. Um, we really want to emphasize that despite all these challenges that we had, truly participatory research is possible in a humanitarian setting, even under the conditions of a global pandemic and uh, really big demands in terms of scope and coordination and remote support. Um, also, that community analysis processes and internal workshops um, were so um, insightful to our process, to our understanding, and really illuminated new data through that secondary analysis, through the eyes of the community. Um, this really brought greater meaning to what we were doing um, that could have potentially otherwise been missed. Um, we would really like to explore um, something Selena mentioned about, could we have come to the same conclusions with smaller amount of data? So I think looking into how that could work is something that we're looking at moving forward. So a smaller data sample, of course, 4,000 stories is, is a lot of information to process. Um, 
Um, and then I think another point that we were discussing is that in recent years, there's been an increasing amount of research that's been conducted on child marriage in humanitarian settings, which of course is excellent. Um, we're learning so much more. We're understanding better the linkages between child marriage and crises. Um, and so just to really make sure that before you engage in data collection with vulnerable populations, um, that you have already scoped out the existing evidence base, which is really important and that we are complementing, not duplicating work that's already been done and ending up with over assessing populations. Um, the second to last point is just to really make sure that project teams are well resourced. I know how challenging this can be when we've got skinny budgets and we're looking at um, uh, trying to do as much as we can, but it really makes such a big difference to make sure that we have a bit of a buffer to allow some flexibility where possible um, for those possible delays, which are quite likely when doing research in humanitarian settings. And then the final point that I think is just so important um, that's already been mentioned by Selena, um, is really the well-being of your research team. I think this is quite classical of protection practitioners that we're really concerned about the population, the community, and we often neglect ourselves in the process. So really making sure that you budget time and resources and you dedicate, um, you dedicate energy to making sure that for the staff who are exposed to emotional or distressing information and activities, that they can get the support that they need. Um, and so this is where I would like to stop. Uh, I can share the link to the research reports from the Philippines, which are already externally available. And if you're interested in the Zimbabwe reports, um, I can send them to you by email um, and they should be going online next week. And I'm sorry that we took a bit longer, um, but I hope that, um, yeah, I look forward to the breakout room with those of you who want to join. Thank you so much. Back to you, Gio. Thanks very much, um, Claire and Selena. And sorry we couldn't um, listen to Gertrude, but we know she's also behind the um, development of these slides. So thanks to her as well. Um, we um, Before we move to um, our colleagues and save the children, I just want to say that producers are going to put um, a link to a Mentimeter uh, in the chat box and you'll be able to share your thoughts on um, the presentation you just listened to and, um, and maybe then bring this thoughts also to the breakout room if you decide to uh, to be in that breakout room. So um, let me go now to um, Roberta Gadler and Salek Uda from um, Save the Children International, my former colleagues, I am glad. And um, um, yes, Roberta and Salek, over to you. I will be flagging in the chat when you have two minutes left. Thank you very much. Thank you, Giovanna. So Thank you. Good morning, evening, everyone. I will let Salek uh, start and then uh, I will take it over to you. Thank you, Roberta. Good morning, everybody. Uh, nice to share with you our experience regarding uh, centrality protection, uh, how to embed the centrality of protection uh, into humanitarian work across sectors to protect uh, the most vulnerable children from harm. Next slide. Uh, just to give you a few uh, content on the uh, context, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mali is affected by uh, conflict since uh, two, 10 years and 80% of uh, uh, countries are experiencing uh, uh, conflict, unfortunately. If the conflict is based on uh, uh, conflict between the government and armed group, uh, but also inter intra community violence springing, spreading from the north and center and now uh, in the south. Uh, that is a really, really difficult context to work and to protect children. Uh, according to um, OCHA and other sources, 4.1 uh, 4 million children uh, is, are in need of uh, humanitarian assistance this year. Uh, increasing number of grave violations against children uh, in conflict, according to the last uh, report from 2020 of uh, UN Secretary General on uh, CAC, uh, we have uh, 809 grave violations uh, uh, reported and verified uh, in 2020. This is an increase of 20% uh, from the uh, previous years. And uh, uh, right now, uh, from the, according to the education cluster, uh, from the March report, we have 1,700 
that uh, 731 uh, schools close due to the insecurity affecting the more than one half of million children in the affected area. This uh, representing sometimes 60% of uh, schools closed due to the insecurity uh, in the areas. Next slide. Regarding our um, engagement community and army group, just to remind that in, in terms of central to protection, save children has two focus area, uh, interagency engagement, community engagement, advocacy, uh, and uh, the last uh, component is uh, um, in, uh, engagement with uh, armed act, no, state actor, answers. So we are focusing on two uh, among uh, four pillars. In terms of community engagement, it's, this experience was based on the, uh, the incident or killing incident uh, 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 happening in 2020-19, where 60% of uh, children from uh, uh, one uh, uh, villages or two villages were killed, and the, our campaign here, based, uh, may, mainly children and youth, had first of all made a statement, reactive statement in the 24 hours, and after that they proactively initiative a campaigning, an initiative supported by Save Children, of course, Khalid Children and uh, Youth Ambassador of Peace to contribute to the social cohesion between uh, community, basically Fulani and Dogan. After this, we got some engagement from uh, uh, community religious and community leaders, religious leaders, sorry, and community leaders to uh, to protect children. They understand the the the, um, the necessity of uh, to protect children and to stop the violence against uh, children, and they commit to support the children and youth uh, uh, engagement. After this, in terms of uh, education school uh, declaration, school safe safe school declaration, of course, uh, based on the uh, school closed, our uh, children partner uh, engage in a campaigning, a awareness campaigning to, to, to get support from communities. And after this, community leaders support this initiative and uh, started to also sensitize the armed group and other actors to reopening some schools. I think Roberta will give some uh, achievement and challenges. In terms of uh, uh, regarding the, our engagement with armed non-state actors, uh, we have uh, we held two uh, workshop in 2021 and 2020, uh, and this commit uh, this help us really to have a direct dialogue with armed group. I mean here a conventional armed group stating uh, in the peace agreement of student with SF. After this, they commit themselves to protect and also to respect the international humanitarian law. We, are, we will see with Roberta some uh, achievement from this initiative. Up to you, Roberta. Thanks, Alec. So I'm um, going on with an, another pillar. If um, if you want to switch the, the slides, please. Um, still under our uh, centrality of protection uh, approach, so um, save the children really try to strengthen the the integrated programming, as uh, as we were saying, that one of our pillar, and uh, in particular in uh, in the region of, of Mopti in, in Mali. Uh, with the um, so child protection uh, integrated with education and uh, child poverty and social uh, protection programming. So one experience uh, is the um, a program, uh, a response mechanism uh, called Rapid Integrated Response Mechanism for Children that aims uh, to, to respond to education, protection and uh, mental health and uh, psychosocial support uh, needs of, uh, of affected uh, uh, boys and girls, uh, and uh, as well as uh, the teachers and uh, and the children caregivers. So it provides uh, quick access uh, for children to to safe school, and uh, at the same time uh, responding uh, to to their needs to to their protection needs uh, through case management, uh, and also with uh, mental health and psychosocial support uh, services. Uh, so we we really worked with um, with teachers also to to strengthen their uh, capacities uh, on child protection, on uh, inclusive uh, and gender sensitive uh, pedagogy, uh, positive uh, discipline, and um, uh, psychosocial uh, um, psychological first aid. Um, so really to strengthen their capacity to 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 work with children to address uh, 
uh, not just educational, but also protection uh, needs of children. And uh, in, um, in parallel, we, we work with, uh, with communities um, uh, structures, so supporting uh, over 60 community committees and two multi-sector uh, platforms who were um, uh, trained to, to, to be able to identify and, uh, and safely refer uh, uh, children for um, protection cases uh, to, to appropriate uh, services, as well as uh, to, to strengthen their capacity on, on monitoring uh, grave violations in their, in their communities and uh, refer uh, children uh, with need of uh, schooling to, to the safe learning uh, spaces. Um, and in terms of uh, cash and voucher assistance, so the the link uh, with, with the child protection was made uh, including uh, protection related uh, criteria uh, into the eligibility criteria for a household to, to receive uh, the cash assistance. And uh, we trained uh, all the, the frontline staff uh, to, on the identification and referral of protection cases to, to adequate uh, um, response services, including for, uh, for GBV and other child protection concerns. Um, and we included uh, a systematic analysis of uh, child protection outcomes uh, of uh, cash assistance uh, into the, um, the post distribution uh, monitoring. So to try to, to understand uh, what, was the, what are the, the outcomes and the, 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 the effect of child protection of our uh, cash pro program. So just to, to wrap up a little bit and uh, as uh, Salek was saying, to, to give you some uh, an idea of, of the achievement and what we could uh, um, could do during, uh, through this uh, this process, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so, uh, in, in terms of commitment, uh, uh, as you heard, uh, we had this commitment from the local uh, community, the religious, and uh, and the, the opinion leaders of the communities, in particular, um, to to promote uh, child protection and uh, safe um, access to schools. Uh, it results, uh, for example, uh, in um, reopening of some uh, of some schools uh, that were closed due, um, uh, due to insecurity. Um, through the, these uh, discussion and dialogues uh, of uh, leaders uh, and uh, our group's uh, representatives. So um, the engagement of these um, North State um, uh, armed groups, uh, it's really something that we are uh, looking forward to see uh, what's um, giving uh, in terms of, uh, of strengthening the protection of children. Uh, already uh, they pledged to release uh, children from their, um, from their groups. Uh, to increase uh, the, the access, the humanitarian access, uh, and uh, to, to reduce occupation and attacks uh, over, um, over schools. Um, so we, we have seen uh, at least uh, since uh, in the last two years that uh, we had somehow a better access to some communities soon and uh, some people in need. Mm -hmm. Um, and just uh, to, to end a bit of evidence uh, of, of the um, cash and voucher approach. Uh, so we, ha we have seen through a study that uh, there is a positive contribution of the cash and voucher assistance to improve uh, family relationship and uh, to, re uh, to reduce uh, in most, um, the most common uh, uh, child protection uh, risks, uh, including GBV, uh, child labor, child marriage, uh, and uh, physical violence uh, and the school drop, uh, dropout. Uh, in the 82% uh, of, uh, of the household that we, we, could, um, we could assist uh, and, uh, and follow up with the post monitoring uh, distribution. So thank you, so it's just a little bit of information, a lot of information <laughs> quickly. So let you, uh, up to you, Joanna. Thank you. Thank you very much both. Um, that was a very interesting um, approach to listen to. And um, um, if our participants would like to share their thoughts um, or have any um, que questions for the thoughts, please um, follow the link on Menti that the producers are going to share in a second and keep your questions and, and share them in the chat. So we'll hopefully we'll be able to answer them at the end. Um, and now we have our third organization, um, our third speakers. So um, colleagues from World Vision International, um, Lynn Descartes and Edouard Ngoy from World Vision um, 
uh, in Central African Republic. So um, over to you, Edouard and Lean, and you have 10 minutes. I will write in the chat and uh, you know already everything. So over to you. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's afternoon for me or good morning for other parts of the world. It's a pleasure to uh, work together uh, today with my colleague from CAR, uh, Edouard, and we're going to talk about uh, a research. It's very much in line with what the plan and SAFE has done. So I feel comforted that we are on the same page, more or less. Uh, so today we are going to talk about how the field of, his, of a vision in CAR has worked with, with me as a I'm, I served here as a researcher for to support them. Uh, how we listened to the population in CAR in uh, the region of uh, Bangasu, and based on this, from the early uh, phase in the project cycle, in the design phase, they uh, adapted their design and their uh, planning and implementation of uh, the interventions. Uh, next slide, please. Edouard will give us some background. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, um, Lean. So as a, as a background, um, um, many um, may not know Central African Republic, but um, it's, it's really a, an area where there has been a lot of uh, political security and rest and um, repetitive economic recessions as well. So the, the country, has been uh, affected by, by that and the resilience of the people uh, has been seriously affected. So children bear the, the brunt of most of the impact of that, as you can imagine. So the most vulnerable and their families are not um, given a chance, especially in uh, program designs to voice their concerns, uh, but also ex um, express their priorities. Um, so there's uh, very little data, especially from government services that you can access uh, to uh, understand the situation on child protection, education and uh, livelihood issues within the Central African uh, Republic. Uh, so World Vision has been working in this area of Bangasu, uh, which is on the east side of the country, as you can see on the map this, um, on the screen. And what we did was to really intentionally uh, shift our focus to talking to the communities, speaking with the children and the young people, uh, speak to their families and, and community actors to understand um, you know, this, how they were leaving the situation, but also their concerns and priorities. And um, that we uh, took into account uh, their uh, ideas and their priorities, especially around child protection, education and livelihood uh, interventions. Um, next slide. Again. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about research. Uh, and as I said, it was really uh, familiar to hear how, especially plan, how we, you used your uh, sense maker. Um, so we did something similar. We integrated uh, data collection tools we adapted them, uh, for instance, our own from the Alliance uh, Child Protection Minimum Standards, but also from um, our brothers from or sisters from the uh, education sector, the INE assessment standards, very helpful, the CHS, the core humanitarian standards, and other guidance. Uh, we, we kind of merged it and uh, tested it into the context of Bangasu district. And originally, I must say, originally our main focus was uh, merging education and child protection, but very quickly we realized that the third sector of livelihoods and, and reducing poverty was um, so instrumental to, to add this layer. As, as you know, the poverty is uh, such a, a major challenge for the population and a root cause of a lot of violence issues. Anyway, we decided to uh, focus only on a qualitative research uh, with young girls and boys, both uh, in and out of school, uh, with parents and caregivers, separated uh, mothers and fathers, and of course, with uh, key informants from the communities. Um, and they 
identified. So it was a very interesting exercise of triangulation to really get the root causes and understand the most urgent needs uh, in Bangasu. So basically this was, um, we, took our, we took enough time and effort to, to do this really uh, well, despite uh, we heard it from the others, the, the, the challenges uh, during COVID times. Still, uh, we feel that this has uh, laid the foundation for an integrated lock frame for the three sectors, uh, child protection, education, and livelihoods, uh, targeting uh, the different uh, players in the ecosystem uh, of child protection, so children and young people, um, with a strong focus as well, uh, inclusion of the most vulnerable children, the girls, children with disabilities, um, the parents, of course, caregivers, and the communities themselves. So as I said, we identified uh, root causes, the key risks and the vulnerabilities for children. Um, and this all hopefully will contribute to achieving our ambitious um, uh, child protection outcomes. Over to you, Edouard. Next slide, please. Uh, Edouard, sorry, you need to unmute yourself. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. No worries. Uh, so as a result of the, uh, the work we've, we've done with communities, including children, um, through focus group discussions and key informant interviews, um, there was um, uh, a lot of understanding from, from our side in terms of getting a comprehensive picture of the challenges that children uh, and the community at large face. And uh, using World Vision's uh, co-project models that we have in place, especially for fragile contexts. So World Vision has a fragile context programming approach uh, in a context like CAR, where we look at different scenarios, what could happen to these children um, in a um, ideal scenario or worst case scenario. And um, you know, discussing that with the community uh, and then coming down to proposing resp a response through a log frame, but also looking at that log frame through different scenarios, how it would play out if things change it within the, the community. Uh, and all of this done through a participatory uh, process. So this really uh, has fed into uh, our, our design and we will be putting in place that uh, um, program um, in a couple of months, and we hope that it's going to bring changes to the lives of, uh, of children and girls. Thank you. Next. So, um, given the time, the limited time we have, we're going to discuss the challenges uh, maybe in our breakout rooms, but I can just share to conclude our presentation with you, uh, our next steps, because this for us, what we did uh, with our fantastic team in CAR, is uh, just the beginning. We, we really want, as well vision, we really want to have a stronger focus on most vulnerable children in the hardest places and really step away. Uh, we've heard it yesterday as well in other sessions that we often focus too much on child protection alone. And we really uh, believe in this cross-sectoral approach um, in the field. So we uh, say, okay, we've learned lessons, we've tried this, we developed these integrated tools, let's use it uh, for a more coherent approach in all fragile contexts. And yet we want to meet the immediate survival needs, but at the same time, we want to address the root causes and drivers of conflict and vulnerability. So we have emphasized the child rights, we have integrated the three sectors as uh, shared with you before, and we hope that we can use this to leverage uh, this approach, this multi-sector holistic approach um, at a global level. So we will further gather evidence together with the team in CAR and learn from it and um, Ultimately, we want to have an aligned assessment tool for other fragile countries to apply in future design processes. And maybe I can just say that 
Um, I'm very grateful for the researchers. Um, also, uh, plan you you mentioned it how important it is to to think of the mental health and the well-being of researchers and people in the field. Well, my admiration and my gratefulness is um, is there definitely for the team, Edouard, for your team in CAR. But uh, over to you, Gio, and uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much both um, for the really interesting um, presentation. There's a lot of um, food for thought from you and the other speakers. And um, um, as I've um, done for the other presentation, we're going to copy a Menti link in the chat box now so uh, people can share their thoughts on this. And if we have time at the end, we'll be able to look at the results. Um, we're a little bit stretched with time and we were supposed to have a break, but um, as um, the presentations are so interesting and I'm sure that um, participants would like to, to hear more and to discuss um, points with the speakers, I would suggest um, if producers are happy as well um, to go straight into breakout rooms. So um, I would just give uh, a little, um, a couple of notes shared also by our producers here on a slide. So um, for those of you who are not familiar, so you can follow the instructions um, to get into different um, breakout rooms. If you decide to stay and uh, in the plenary session, you will be, uh, we have placed word vision to remain in, in this room, so in the, in the main room. And um, if instead you would like to uh, participate in discussions with Save the Children or with PLAN, you can just um, go at the bottom where you see um, I have three dots or there probably are four squares um, next to the app icon. And there you can choose breakout rooms. And once you click there, you'll be able to see them and join them directly. And please, producers, jump in if um, I have not explained it properly. Uh, if people have trouble, they can also write directly in the chat and we'll try to, to move you. Um, so we have also to add that we have uh, um, uh, pre-selected some questions uh, for the facilitation of the, um, of the breakout rooms. So it'll be the content leads uh, themselves who will be doing um, that. So you'll be talking to them directly. Uh, and you will see the Jamboard links in, in a second. Julie, sorry, did you want to jump in? Uh, nope, nope, you're you're doing great. Just uh, if anyone has any issues uh, moving themselves into the breakout rooms, just let us know. The breakout rooms are open. There you go. Yep. Okay, brilliant. So the links are all there. So um, yeah, we should be fine. And uh, Riyadh and myself will be moving across the, the three rooms and um, yeah, looking forward to, to listen to all the discussions. We'll be in breakout rooms for um, 15, uh, between 15 and 20 minutes. We'll see how the conversations go. If you need yeah. the time, we'll do 20. Otherwise, we'll keep it down to 15 and give more space to the panel discussion later. Okay, over for me. <laughs> Hello, um, this is the breakout room for um, World Vision. Um, yeah, cool. Hello, everyone. Let's wait uh, one more minute. I think people are still finding their ways. All right, Leanne, I think you might as well kick off. You've got All 13 right. participants still here with you. Perfect. Okay, so uh, hello again. I hope you, um, you found your you found your way in um, in this session and that uh, information we shared uh, was useful. So Edward and I, we would like to open the, um, the breakout room by asking if you, in your own work, in your own practice, have you done something similar, what we explained uh, in our presentation? Have you developed integrated tools to do research in the field? And if yes, can you please share a little bit how you did this and um, maybe some lessons learned or challenges just to open the discussion. Thank you. And please feel free uh, to unmute yourself and uh, to share with us.
or if you have any other question uh, following our presentation, Edouard is also here with us. He's uh, the operations manager of the field team, um, our national office in CAR. So if you have more questions about uh, the practicalities or the challenges in doing field-based research. Well, I would have a, a question on that. Um, yes, how do you go about um, getting in touch with the community? Like, what's the first step in that? Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, Alske, Edouard, would you like to respond? Sure. Um, you know, World Vision, uh, we work in both uh, a development and emergency settings. So sometimes the steps we take for community engagement are, are quite different. Uh, in, in a development setting, we have a much more elaborate process. Um, we, we have a sort of a critical path that we go through for, for months to introduce ourselves, to get to know the community. Now in emergency setting, what happens is that um, usually we, we go to respond to a disaster and we have very short time to understand the situation, but also uh, design a, pro um, a program in response to the community needs. So uh, usually when we get in a community, we, you know, we, we do this, um, we got to see the leaders of the community to introduce ourselves in terms of what we have come to do. And um, then we ask to meet the people who are affected. We try to understand the context, of course, in the area, but also meet uh, the beneficiaries who are being affected by the situation, just to have a, a sense of the emergence, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the needs of, of the community and um, design uh, our programs based on that. So in a nutshell, that, that's the process we use, but it's more elaborate when you are in a development setting. And, and is there anything uh, different in that approach regarding getting in touch with children or adolescents? Yes, the, um, we need to, uh, to, to include the voices of children uh, to understand how they're being impacted by the situation. And uh, these are girls and boys, as, as you know, that they're affected sometimes very differently. So we do have processes and tools to do either focus group, um, um, usually focus group discussions with, with kids or some types of activities with them to understand the situation. Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, Lynn. Hi, Tina. Tina is my colleague. <laughs> yeah. Nice to see her. Nice to see you too. Um, just to add on to the feedback on the question that has been made, in mm -hmm. some contexts, such as in Kenya, where I am, uh, before you get access to the communities, it's usually good to get um, the go ahead from the local um, authorities. So the practice usually is to, you know, go to the local administration offices, um, share with them the intention of your planned activities and that you're going to engage the communities so that they are aware and they give the clearance for you to continue to engage. So that's usually another very critical step before starting the process. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And maybe I can add a point. Uh, it's very important to gain the trust of your, of the populations, affected populations, from the beginning all the way till the end. So when we do research and we ask these sensitive questions in a, uh, in a challenging context, um, you cannot just do your research go and and do the the rest of the work in the national office. You always need to have. The, the loop to give feedback uh, to the population. Um, I think that's very important and sometimes we, we tend to forget we are sometimes too much focused on uh, you know the processes in the national office and um, that's the big lesson learned I, I would say that uh, by doing this intentionally that you really give a voice to the most uh, vulnerable 
people. Um, uh, yeah, this is Patrick. Yes, um, please. Patrick. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I heard Edward say that sometimes it's challenging for them because they have less time uh, where they get into a community and they have to understand the challenges that they, the community is facing. And then mm -hmm. they have short time to think through an approach or program that really uh, is relevant for that community. And I was like, uh, could you tell us how much you involve the community in designing a specific uh, program for them? Because from what I know, what is built from in I mean, from within the community, where you're able to gather their their thoughts on what is best for them, because sometimes we come with uh, already made solutions and 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 uh, approaches and programs that may not work for specific communities. So, how much are you able to involve them in designing your programs and approaches for them to be successful in, in the field? Thanks. This is such a great question, Patrick. Edouard, would you like to uh, answer this? Sure. Uh, thank you, Patrick, for the question. And yes, we, um, although the, the time is sometimes limited, but we do have uh, ongoing uh, community engagement, even as we, 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 we seek for ways to um, design a program. So, in this, this case of this child protection and education, uh, we did what we call the, um, the context analysis, good enough context analysis for rapid response. But it is a process that involves communities providing uh, feedback into uh, what the situation they are in and, and the, the priorities from their standpoint. And we take into account those priorities uh, in the design. We've actually had to, even after the design uh, workshops, et cetera, had to go back to the community to validate uh, yeah. even the assumptions that we had, the scenarios that we had um, built around the programming, just to ask them if they, they felt like this was reflective of the reality they were living in. And they were you know, saying like, yes, actually this scenario is actually even happening right now. So we do that validation to make sure we're not right. you know, uh, proposing things from our own uh, understanding. Um, and so yes, the, there's time taken to, to listen. And I think uh, this presentation is also about how we do it with children, being intentional about listening to children. I, mm -hmm. I, I forgot to mention that uh, even yesterday, the hall of our senior leadership we were meeting with 13 children from uh, a community and discussing uh, what are their needs, what problems they see in the community and how they think they can be resolved. So th this is taken into account uh, in the design. Yeah. If I may add a point, uh, dear colleagues, what is important is that you are very transparent uh, and you manage expectations with uh, the populations. Um, we, are, we come in, we are an international NGO, um, and we know that the needs, the humanitarian needs, exceed our available human and financial resources. So, yes, we, we should listen to them, and they can validate our um, proposed design. Uh, but, Edouard, you will agree with me, there is always, we need to find a balance between what we can do and when, what we cannot do. Uh, we can only contribute a fraction of what is really required uh, to offer a decent life in, um, in, in that corner of car. Is that correct, uh, Edouard? Yes, that is uh, very correct. So yes, we have to balance because there's so many needs that come mm -hmm. out of um, uh, community engagement. And we, we have uh, through participatory processes to discuss with them what World Vision can actually do and what mm. we can focus on. Um, sometimes we also get a funding from donors like uh, WFP uh, who have their uh, you know, standard uh, response, which of course yeah. integrates 
the feedback from communities, but it's it's uh, it's you know a kind of standard uh, activities yeah. that we we do with the community, and and they're, they're part of the needs of the communities anyway. There's nothing that we do that doesn't respond to the needs that communities have. Yeah. So what do you do, for instance, the example of WFP, do you negotiate with the donor to have some flexibility uh, based on what the population has told you? Um, yes, I mean, for instance, let's take uh, cash vouchers that we do under WFP. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sometimes communities can, can tell you uh, you know, we have mechanism for accountability to the communities where they provide feedback either through, you know, hotline or a suggestion box or any relevant um, mm -hmm. you know, approach where we hear from the community and we make sure that we integrate their, um, you know, the, the requests or their issues that they're dealing with. For instance, if there's a security issue uh, for some community in some villages, maybe um, that need to be taken into account that we listen to them and we make sure that that is integrated. Uh, but it's within the existing uh, activities that we have, um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Gio, I'm looking at you. Do we still have time maybe for one more question? We have two more minutes. So um, yeah, increase the time. So, or uh, anybody wants to say a concluding remark to you, if you want. Well, I um, I don't know whether you wanted um, participants wanted to capture any thoughts on the jump board. I was just trying to find the the way to link again. Um, I think the link was shared above if you all can see the chat. But otherwise, um, people can still think about questions and ask them in the plenary. Um, when the mm -hmm. other the groups come back um, sure. so we've just reminded people to um to ask the questions because we haven't seen any but otherwise yeah. uh, you know uh it would be good to just kind of have everyone back wait and we have yeah. another minute so that we can just maybe draw some um some key um key points but um okay. i was really um personally um really interested about your approach and I think you know um, it's just so valid and it goes so hand in hand with the other uh, with what you know plan yeah. and uh, save the children have also been talking yeah. about and uh, you know um, as it, I was working on centrality of protection before um, this current role so actually what uh, save the children and you know Robert and Salik are working on and you know like the um, aspect of integrated um, child protection analysis and so on and the use for example of the NIAF when it was still um, you know at, within the CPOR was uh, central so you know looking at how to work with other sectors to really collect information that we need to um, achieve child protection outcomes and that's really what you're doing so I hope that you'll be able to really um, share you know and um, your tool and uh, test it in okay. as many contexts as you can as you just said yeah. that We'll be trying to um, validate it even more and uh, really share it and make it become hopefully like an interagency tool because that's you know the way we do um, collection and analysis of data is the beginning of everything um, in terms of programs isn't it so yeah. if we get that right and we do it including communities and uh, um, involving all the sectors then uh, we're already off to a very good start so that's that's what right. made away from your presentation but um, yeah I think we're well um, now. Yeah. <laughs> um, I am uh, as confused as you as in terms of uh, uh, what to do. I because we're in the plenary one. I think we don't actually have to do anything, and we'll just be put together with the other ones. But yeah, uh, yeah. we can we can open sure. the doors. Open the door. <laughs> the the door. rooms will close in about twenty seconds. Ah, okay. We'll all be back with you. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks, Edward. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank and you, Marcy. Friends, uh, it's great to have you. Please don't be shy and pop your questions and uh, um, we'd love to hear your, um, you know, your personal thoughts. Okay, people are coming back.
Mm. Hi, everyone. Um, I think people are coming back, or maybe we're all back. Um, I hope you had um, a good time discussing in the breakout rooms. Um, we had provided Jamboard links in case you wanted to capture some of those thoughts, and uh, um, we'll have those links um, still active uh, at the end of the session. So if you want to go back to those and look at um, how the discussions went in the other groups, you're welcome to do that. So um, we now have um, not a lot of a lot of time, but if uh, but this is the time to ask questions if you have got any and if you didn't have a chance to um, direct them at the um, speakers and the content leads uh, in the breakout rooms. And um, if not, um, we have um, a couple of questions that we wanted to ask uh, our, um, our presenters and. Um, if everyone is happy, I'll just go ahead. I had the first question that was, um, um, and that I just thought about um, with Save the Children and World Vision in mind. Uh, and that was, what are the main challenges you faced um, and how did you overcome them? And uh, so I'll ask Lean or Edouard to maybe go first and give us, you know, a flavor of this for um, two minutes. And then I'll hand over to um, Roberta or Salek. So yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Gio. Um, we quickly discussed this already in the breakout room, but um, Edouard can confirm. Uh, the, the challenge is that um, the situation, the needs are so high in, in uh, the context of CAR um, that you have to be super careful not to create expectations or let's say manage the expectations of the affected populations um, when you are in the design phase, especially as, as an international NGO uh, with a, a decent budget. But I'll ask Edouard to add points if he likes. Thank you, Lynn. That, that's very true. Uh, one of the challenges we face is to balance between the resources we have and the needs uh, the community uh, has. And so uh, also how, how as an, a child-focused organization do we give priority to children when the adults uh, are talking about other things, sometimes not thinking about children at all. So it's a, it, it's a facilitation process that leads to deciding with the communities what is best for the children uh, in, in, a, in a specific context. But in, in CAR, of course, we also have issues to do with um, access. Some of the areas where the needs are highest are also not easily accessible, both from a security point of view, but also from an infrastructure uh, point of view. So uh, for instance, this study we did in, in Bangasu, we could have done um, more with uh, more of our teams uh, deploying, but it's a place you can't drive to. You only have to fly and on, you only have limited um, uh, space on, on, on the flights. So those are some of the challenges, but I think uh, having the team in the field helps a lot. So what we do is train our staff in the field to do some of the, uh, you know, the community engagement work and then the, the the experts can also fly in and, and work with them. So yeah, let me, let me stop there. Thanks so much. Thank you very much both. Um, I'll go to Save the Children. Um, if Roberta or Salek, you would like to... Um... Roberta, you can uh, start. Are you... Of course. Yeah. Of course. Thank you. So but we, we shared a little bit uh, uh, current experience, of course, with the insecurity and difficulties of uh, access in some uh, some areas, uh, and then uh, the main challenges we have um, we have seen is uh, really to follow up on the engagement that uh, taken by the, the armed non-state actors uh, who collaborated, in, who participated in the in the workshop. Uh, they they engaged, but of course, uh, these are uh, uh, non-compulsory plans. Uh, and so we have a limited capacity to, to monitor their implementation. Um, and uh, and uh, another, uh, another 
challenge, uh, I would say, it's really to maintain uh, the, the, accept the acceptance uh, in, uh, in conflict after affected communities uh, where, uh, where the formal services are not welcomed. So the acceptance of, of the work that, uh, that we are doing and uh, really focusing and keeping in mind that uh, do no harm, it's the, the basic principles. So we want to engage communities, of course, uh, uh, but we have to to consider that uh, it can have uh, adverse uh, effects on, uh, on on their security and then it can expose uh, them to to risk so sometimes uh, it's maybe better to uh, to really uh, co consider and really it's it's really important always to to, to really have a um, an, a strong uh, assessment uh, risk assessment uh, before uh, before implementing uh, this kind of activities i don't know uh, Asalek, if you want to add uh, something Yes. Um, Salik, sorry, we can't hear you. <laughs> sorry, sorry, it was me. I think I will adjust the, the challenge regarding the inter-cluster uh, coordination uh, engagement. As I said, there is a lot of turnover uh, within uh, cluster protection, protection cluster. And uh, in terms of uh, leadership uh, coming from the uh, a, a country humanitarian team, we need more commitment for the leadership to embedding to mainstreaming central protection within uh, uh, clusters and inter cluster work. And this is uh, our main objective this year with uh, others to make sure that there is a, a common commitment, minimum commitment uh, through inter clusters uh, to make sure that we will uh, together uh, uh, overcome the challenge in terms of acceptance in terms of credibility, legitimacy now, and the respect of our humanitarian principles. That is a big challenge from the context of money. Thank you so much, Salek. Um, I will just, uh, uh, before I, um, I do a small wrap up, I'll, I'd like to ask a question also to our colleagues from PLAN. Um, and for them, as um, uh, the project is uh, um, a longer term project. I'd like to know what the next uh, steps are, what your, um, uh, what your future uh, looks like for your project. Uh, yeah, if you have any, um, anything that you'd like to um, highlight, particularly with, uh, with the other content leads um, and with the, with the participants today. Yeah, uh, thanks so much. Um, yeah, we have quite a bit in the pipeline um, and um, so, of course, we're looking at how we can integrate and apply these learnings into our current programming and how best we can prioritize child marriage uh, within both the context in Zimbabwe and the Philippines, as well as at global level. Um, I think you might see us over the next few months disseminating our research in various platforms. If you would like to know more about it, please do just get in touch. Um, but the, you, yeah, you should see this. And there's also going to be... Um, an event hosted in September, which will be a bit more of a deep dive into the findings, which we didn't really get to talk about too much today. Um, and then also in partnership with Women's Refugee Commission, as well as Save the Children and the Human Rights Center, who've also been conducting research on, on child marriage in humanitarian settings. We're pulling together all of our findings to build a theory of change and a program model. Um, so this should also be, um, uh, this will be used then to develop uh, two pilot projects that we will then make available for, for external use as well. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and then also one other thing to point out is that based on our learnings from this project and this research together with research we've conducted with UNHCR, we're pulling together a toolkit on conducting um, child marriage uh, context analyses. Um, so that should be available hopefully early next year. Um, and then perhaps based on our breakout room discussions, um, we might be hosting a session with our technology partner on SenseMaker about how to use storytelling as a methodology and, uh, and thinking about what kind of tools we might be using and uh, we might um, others might need in order to do similar studies. So, um, yeah, an additional point on my to do list, but I think really useful uh, for others to take this on. Um, thanks. And I'm happy to share resources uh, afterwards if that's helpful by email. Thanks. 
Thanks so much, Claire. Thanks to colleagues um, at Plan. And um, I can see um, so we had, had um, uh, a small problem. So I'll take over with the questions. We have, I can see two. Um, I think we might be able to answer one. Um, I'll have to go with the first one just for <laughs> just for fairness. But if um, if content leads would like to reply to the questions, they can do it as well as, uh, you know, um, uh as we go with the with the answer so um the first question is from elske and he reads um how do you go about social and psychological support for the community and interviewees on the short and long term as bringing up these topics may be sensitive both on the personal and community level um who would like to um to uh, to reply to this question i think um obviously all organizations are you know have experience of that and uh, being child protection and child focus organizations you all uh, have the um, safeguarding measures as well as uh, mit risk mitigation measures in place and I know that for um, so I don't know um, maybe just a word or two um, we literally have uh, one minute or maybe two for, for this answer. Um, yeah. I know we brought this up as planned so maybe I can just 10 seconds um, it's really hard to be honest. I think that we can have the best intentions um, to provide as much support as we can. And I, and I think it will always never be enough. Um, so this is why I think we have to really critically think about, do we need to do these interviews? Do we need this data? And thinking about how we collect that data. So that's why we use the methodology we use because we felt that it was as powerful and as survivor centered as possible. But of course it's still potentially traumatic. Um, so I think, of course, trying to make sure that your your work, your data collection is in areas where maybe you know that there's programming, you know that there's functional services. And I know that that's difficult because you want to be doing it in the hardest to reach places. But if there is no support, no backup for the population, once you've taken your data, then I think that is doing more harm. Um, so I think just being really critical of um, not only trying to reach the hardest place, but making sure that people have that support after you leave, which sometimes means that you do the community one step closer because there is a little support. Um, but it's 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 always a constant flux of risks and benefits to, to always the population that, um, yeah, there's no perfect, but I think just trying to be um, uh, refocused on the, on the population as much as possible. Can I add a point? Uh, at World Vision, we have, of course, like other organizations, ethical co considerations always uh, when we develop terms of reference, when we negotiate with the teams in the country, what and how will we collect data. For instance, on sexual violence, uh, that's super sensitive. We are not going to have focus group discussions, uh, mixed boys and girls, just to give an example, because this is too uh, delicate. It's uh, against the do no harm principle, as Claire mentioned. Uh, so there are some some critical considerations and, and limitations and we can get data uh, through other sources as well. So it's not always necessary to ask the difficult questions in, in a focus group, for instance. Uh, and like the sense maker uh, approach of plan, we also have the vignette. It's very well known, um, an approach where you can ask sensitive uh, topics uh, with communities. Thank Thanks so much, Lynn. Um, uh, and Roberta, I'm sure you would like to, to chip in, but um, we don't have much time. I just wanted to go over um, another question that we had and um, that says, did you share with the community's children consulting the results of the research consultations you did and how the recommendations, and if yes, and how was this taken? Um, I don't know if this was discussed in the breakout rooms, but it obviously has to do with feedback mechanisms and uh, ensuring that uh, um, that engagement that starts at the beginning also then um, is uh, uh, reflected at the end. Um, so, you know, that communities are really involved from uh, from the start and throughout the, the, the project cycle, right? So I don't know if Roberta, maybe you want to... Um, and say a word or two on uh, on how communities are involved or, or how do they receive the messages um, afterwards or during the course of your project as well. Yes, of course, uh, as we were saying, it's um, it's not just uh, 
training communities and saying, yeah, okay, you, you need to, to give us feedback from, from what's happening. It's really working with communities and uh, um, it's something that takes time. Uh, of course, we need to, to, to work at different levels with leaders, uh, being uh, uh, also sure that uh, we are involving uh, different uh, groups uh, in the community. So, so there, um, um, there is a work uh, doing in, in the time uh, and, um, and really ensuring that we, we are sharing uh, uh, the, the, the information at different levels and we are not uh, leaving out uh, anyone. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And sorry, we don't have um, um, more time to, um, to give space to, for reflections, but um, we have a minute left. So uh, I can see there's, um, there's more comments coming. Um, possibly uh, content leads can continue um, until um, then the session will be closed and continue to answer. We've reached the end of this session on community um, level child protection and working across sectors. Um, I want to um, give a warm thank to all the speakers today and uh, for their really insightful presentations. I think the, 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 we will ask you all to write your key takeaway in the chat. If um, my takeaway is uh, probably uh, quite banal, uh, but you know, I think it's uh, also um, quite important and it's, um, it says that uh, engaging communities is not um, it's not difficult. It's it, it actually can be done, and it should be done. And we have enough experience now as a sector to do it, and we have no excuses in not doing it. And at the same time, um, by in and by including communities in uh, engaging them from the start of a project, we know that. Um, multi multi sector needs will arise, and so we can't adopt a uh, one sector approach only. We need to, and also as child protection practitioners, we need to open up and um, um, try and include as much as possible other sectors and make ourselves understood to other sectors. Um, so yeah, these are my um, key takeaways. I have many others, but um, yeah, there's no time. Very lovely to have you here, and um, thank you. Please write your takeaways in the chat. And uh, wish everybody a um, lovely rest of the day. And thanks thank for me. Thank you. Thank Bye. you for having us. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. For thank thanks, you. everyone. Thank you. Bye. thank you very much. Bye-bye. Goodbye. <laughs>